Many may not realize it, but the EIB is the world's largest multilateral financial institution and a key player in international development. From the ongoing war in Ukraine to the uncertainty and inflationary challenges plaguing the global, global economy, to the climate and debt crises that are unfolding, Europe and indeed the world are facing a reckoning. The EIB has a critical role to play in addressing these challenges. Now the EU's 27 finance ministers who make up the board of the bank will soon appoint the new president behind closed doors. In an attempt to inject some transparency to the process and bring it to life, we approached all the candidates to participate in a conversation about their vision for the future of the bank. And I'm absolutely delighted to have Margrethe Vestea join for the first of the conversations. Margrethe is currently the Executive Vice President of the European Commission and Commissioner for Competition. Her reputation precedes her with a long and illustrious political career. Margrethe, thank you very much for joining me. It is such a pleasure and uh, I'm grateful uh, that you do it. Uh, I think you underlined it very well that there is a need for, for transparency. Those of us who, who have the privilege of uh, are working with power in power, uh, I think it's important that people get to know us. Super. Then let's start with, with perhaps the most obvious uh, of questions. Makaita, can you tell us a little bit about your career and your background and how you think your experiences would contribute to your success as EIB president? Well, um, everyone can, can look at my CV uh, and maybe that's not the most interesting part. Uh, I'm the mother of three daughters. Uh, I was newly a grandmother for the first time. Uh, I have lived my life in, in politics. This year I have made a living of politics for 25 years. And I have held a number of different uh, positions. And, and what I have learned from being a minister, from being a, a deputy prime minister, um, is the kind of responsibility that you need uh, not only to feel, but to take, uh, how much you need to listen uh, in order to uh, work well, and how much you rely on your team. And now for, for nine years, I have been working as a commissioner uh, in the European Commission, part of the European uh, democracy. And um, here as a commissioner for competition, uh, equal treatment of member states, level playing field. Those two ideas have been sort of my, my guide, guiding, guiding uh, values. So I think that is, that is what I come from, uh, bringing all of Europe on board. I, I come from a small country and, uh, and coming from a small country, you learn to negotiate, you learn to make coalitions, you learn that you can not always have it your way, uh, but you can always make it better when you are part of a team and if you're willing to uh, negotiate uh, and find the compromise that can bring everyone uh, further on. So I think those are my, my learnings uh, over these years in, in politics, national politics, European politics, uh, and you know, just underlining that uh, that the team is what creates success and uh, and listening probably is the strongest uh, leadership tool that you can have. That's great, thank you. Uh, I'm curious as to why the EIB though, and let's imagine you are successful in your candidacy and, and appointed president of the EIB. It would be great if you could give us a sense of what you think the bank would look like at the end of your first term. Um, in other words, what's your vision? What are your aspirations? Well, two different uh, sides of that coin. Uh, one is for internal reform of the bank. The bank has grown uh, a lot in the last 10 years, almost doubling its number of, uh, of uh, people working there. Uh, it has increased its volume, it's doing a lot. 
but it needs to be faster. So, you know, I would hope that after the first term playing this, this game, that uh, the bank would sort of be in a triangle of quality in the work, speed of the work, and relevance for member states uh, and for people. Because what happens in, in Europe now, and I think that's a global condition, is the need of acceleration. We need to invest more, we need to invest faster. So there is a need of, of reform uh, of the bank uh, in itself. These many, uh, you know, skilled, exquisite, engaged people working in the bank, I think they should see their effect on ground much faster than what they do today. And the second thing is that the bank should be uh, even more strategic, so closer uh, aligned to the other European institutions. Uh, what is decided in the European Council, in the European Parliament, because the European Investment Bank is the investment arm to help us achieve what we want for Europe. Climate change, fighting climate change, adapting to what we cannot uh, avoid, uh, making sure we use uh, technology in the best possible way, um, enabling that all these great uh, innovative businesses in Europe also scale up uh, in Europe, all that change in our industrial pattern with deep tech. And all of that with the fundamental call uh, that founded our European democracy, which is cohesion and uh, the need for social balance. Because those calls and those promises, they are, they are not fulfilled yet. And that, of course, is part for me of, of the bank value. So let, let's unpack that one a little bit. Um, so you mentioned speed, you know, um, moving faster. Now, the EIB, you know, is a slow moving, steady, if you like, tanker. How do you get the machinery, the bureaucracy to move faster? Well, I think one, one thing is, is a, a deep quality in the bank, which is that it's patient money. And you need that kind of sort of patient funding for urgent needs. Uh, because what happens right now needs funding right now. But I think there are uh, processes that can be run faster. I think there is scope for an increased use of, uh, of digitization, using of data, use of AI in order to speed up processes. But of course, this is me looking at it from the outside. I think the first thing one should do coming on board is of course to listen very carefully uh, to the people who are there. Because what I see in the bank is that that there is a wish to be so much more relevant and part of being relevant is being faster even when you're a tanker even you when you're the worst world's uh, biggest uh, development bank you still need speed in order for people to see that you serve them well super thank you so uh, let's let's uh, move on a little bit i mean so in my introduction, I mentioned, um, you know, the extremely challenging backdrop that the next president of the EIB mm. will be operating against um, and some of the issues that they will have to tackle head on. And of course, one of those issues is climate. Um, now, in 2020, the EIB published a roadmap for 2021 to 2025. Uh, with a, a commitment to increase its support for climate action and environmental sustainability, and with a target of more than 50% of its lending activities uh, for climate-related uh, uh, projects, and also to fully align its financing activities with the Paris Agreement. Mm. So what's next post-2025 for you? Um, I mean, what, what do you see as the EIB's um, climate strategy going forward? And can the bank be perhaps a bit more ambitious than it currently is in supporting climate action? I think it can, but we still need to get to 2025. Uh, and we need to learn from that road as to then how to push it further. Uh, and how to combine uh, the fight against climate change and adaption to, to uh, climate effects with uh, other things that you do. When, when you support um, 
uh, public housing or uh, building of hospitals, that you also think about how to do that so that this investment, they are, they are climate uh, secured, uh, that you build in a way that is actually done in a way so that these buildings can sustain and that they have the slightest possible uh, carbon footprint. So I think it's important to learn with the investment that we do these days so that climate is always a dimension uh, in what we do. Uh, and this is also because uh, it will be the, uh, the task, the challenge, the honor of our generation uh, to uh, rebuild Ukraine into becoming a member of the European Union. And here I think there, is, there are very important and needed learnings to have. How do you do that? in a way so that you at the same time uh, fulfill your climate uh, promises. And, uh, and I think that that learning back and forth is really important because we have so many targets. We have so many promises. What we need to do is to implement all that existing technology we have already, all that existing knowledge we have already, learn from that and then to push on, uh, because I think people need to see action on ground. Uh, otherwise, there is a risk of, I think, climate fatigue, that people start shrugging their shoulders and say, it's too late, and they just talk about the targets. They need to see action on ground, and they need to see that, that we, decision makers uh, in different positions, learn from that. So then speaking of action on the ground, I mean, there have been several African leaders, for example, who have stated that renewables alone cannot develop the continent. And in fact, President Hoyer has maintained that um, the EIB will not reverse its ban on fossil fuel lending. Do you subscribe to this view? Well, I, I think it's important uh, not to say that uh, there is only a fossil way to development. Um, and I think it's important, uh, the commitment that the bank has made to become a climate bank, uh, working, I think, steadily, uh, consistently in that direction. Uh, because we, we need to not only, of course, challenge views that development implies fossil fuel, but also to find ways uh, to make sure that we get there. We have all the known technologies of, uh, of solar, wind, uh, water. We have the emerging technologies of, uh, of hydrogen, uh, new kind of batteries, uh, wave uh, energy. Uh, and we need to figure out how to combine uh, because we have very little time uh, to fight climate change. Uh, the risk of getting to the trigger point is increasing uh, by the day if, if we do not invest uh, wisely. Um, but that is not a contradiction uh, to the, the promise to support development because 10% of the bank's uh, funding can be invested outside of Europe. And that is a lot of money. And that, of course, needs to enable countries uh, to develop. Great. So we'll, we'll come to um, the EIB's external investments. Um, but before we do, let's talk a little bit about Ukraine. Um, you mentioned, you know, reconstruction uh, of Ukraine. Now, just in 2002, following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, I think the EIB dispersed almost 2 billion euros in immediate assistance to the country. Um, and then in 2023, this year, uh, the Board of Governors approved the creation of an EU for Ukraine fund for which member states have only contributed around 400 million euros uh, to support Ukraine's most urgent needs. Now, this is a drop in the ocean in terms of what will actually be needed. I mean, uh, under your presidency, what role do you envisage the EIB actually playing in terms of both short-term assistance uh, to Ukraine, but also longer-term reconstruction? Uh, I think the EIB has a very important role to play because the EIB is the investment arm of European uh, strategies. And it is, it's a clear European strategy 
to enable Ukraine uh, and support Ukraine in the situation of an aggressive war uh, that Russia has verged uh, on them right now, uh, but also to reconstruct. And uh, right now, a number of, of different sources of financing comes to Ukraine. Uh, the European Union in itself has financed uh, this year 18 billion just to keep the state uh, going. Uh, not to mention what all member states uh, are, are helping out uh, with weapons, uh, uh, housing, uh, refugees, uh, and starting the reconstruction. You know, what has been done, for instance, to make sure that the energy grid is working, that water supply is working, that communication is working when destroyed by the attackers uh, of Ukraine. That is really important. And, and looking forward, it's very important that there is a division of labor between different international organizations so that everyone know what, ev what others are doing uh, in order uh, to make sure that it's a common approach. And I think it's, it's really important and, and I admire what the bank has done so far to say we need a present in Ukraine already now because even though as sad as it is, the war is still ongoing, one need to think about the future every day, so I think, to, to, to keep up the spirits. And this is why the presence of the bank is important. And this is why, even though this financing so far is not a lot, this is, these are the seeds sown in order to create that kind of volume that will be needed uh, for Ukraine uh, to reconstruct into becoming a member of the European Union. Super, thank you. Let's let's talk about EIB Global now. Um, so again, in 2022, the EIB launched um, EIB Global, uh, the bank's dedicated branch for investments outside of the EU. Now, at the latest EIB forum this year, um, the incumbent uh, president uh, Hoyer argued that EIB Global should seek to gain the firepower to provide the EU with the necessary financial clout to pursue its strategic objectives in the world. Now, you mentioned, you know, 10% of um, EIB investments uh, go towards um, countries outside uh, of, the EU, of, of the EU. I mean, do you share this view that EIB firepower should be um, increased? Well, I think in in total, uh, the EIB should increase its uh, its financing, both in Europe and then, of course, then the 10% would be, in, in nominal terms, also be more. Um, and I think it's really important that this investment outside of, uh, um, of Europe is seen with uh, what is called sort of the Team Europe spirit, that the European uh, Common Budget, administered by, by the European Commission, and what member states are doing, so the Team Europe approach, that this is seen together so that we can be more strategic uh, in, in what we do outside of Europe. And I think that alignment uh, would be great. Uh, I think also here there is a need for, for speed uh, to be cost effective uh, in order for the bank to be relevant. But the most important increased volume is, of course, good projects, that there is a wish. And, uh, and here, a, an increased presence of Europe, uh, outside of Europe, that is absolutely key. And one of the things that I have uh, appreciated very much is, uh, is the increased presence both in, in Latin America, in, uh, on the African continent, uh, the agreements, for instance, we have uh, in digital with, with countries in, in Southeast uh, Asia, because when you have that kind of partnership, well, then comes projects, then comes ideas about what to fund. It cannot be the volume of funding in itself that is the driver, but what you want to do together. And, uh, and that presence and that visibility of Europe, outside of Europe, I think that's a, that's a geopolitical uh, necessity uh, for Europe to to fulfill its uh, its ambitions. So, Margreta, two of the things that the that EIB Global has uh, in its nascent days been criticised for are 
One, um, it's lack of presence on the ground. And um, we know that the, the idea of trying to set up um, uh, hubs in, in certain countries has taken off. But I'd like to hear your thoughts on the lack of presence overall on the ground. Um, and then secondly, is the fact that the EIB's, EIB Global's approach to risk um, has been very, very cautious. So uh, it's not um, a, a sort of a strong risk taker. And especially in when it comes to international development, this has been a hindrance um, in terms of its investments. So what, what are your thoughts on those two issues? I don't, uh, I don't know enough uh, about uh, the level of presence. Uh, I haven't uh, uh, in detail studied uh, the criticism of, of not having a sufficient presence, so, so that I would not know. Uh, I think in, in general there is room um, to uh, both to find different instruments of financing where some instruments can be uh, more risk-taking uh, than others. Uh, because the, the sort of the bread and butter uh, of the bank is that you have a triple A rating so that you can lend on and then further lend on to, to other important projects, which is part of being relevant that you sort of vouch for, uh, for the projects to the people that lend to you. Uh, and, and here, uh, one of the, the strongholds of the bank is the uh, quality of its technical expertise, technical advice, ability to to um, to develop a project, and and I think those qualities should not be given up because that is also what sort of secures that when the EIB goes in, then others they come on board. You can crowd in quite a lot of of other financing because it's a sign of quality uh, when the EIB goes in. But that being said, uh, I think we live in a world where it's important uh, to take more risks. Uh, you know, I, I now have a leave from my, my, my job, my position in, in the European Commission. I'm here on a stage. Everyone can see what I do and, and I might not get the job. Uh, you know, I want to sort of also, as a, as a person, show I am willing to take that risk uh, because I think that makes it more credible that I also think that the bank should take more risks. Super. And, and, it, and just on this issue of risk, I mean, wh what we're seeing is some of the other multilateral development banks, like the World Bank, um, they're, they're in a process of rethinking their current roles, their mandates, uh, especially to deal with the sort of multiple challenges um, that the world is facing. Um, they're also looking at their risk approaches. I mean, do you think the EIB needs to go through this in, internal sort of um, inspection to rethink its its current role and mandate? Well, as said initially, I think uh, internal reform is needed in order to gain speed. And, and only if you are sufficiently fast uh, are you still relevant mm -hmm. uh, for those who need financing. And if you want to, to, to gain more speed, well, you have this challenge of figuring out how to maintain the quality and the assessment of projects so that they are sufficiently developed, that they can be pulled off, while at the same time saying, we're willing to take a risk on you. We think that you can do this, even though not all I's have been dotted, not all T's and have been crossed. So, so that is a, a balancing act. And the second thing is, I don't think that every international uh, financing organizations should play the same role. I think it's important that we play different roles. Uh, the EIB will finance for, for 90% uh, is a European uh, bank that finances things where, where finance is, uh, is needed and cannot just be, be, be found on the market. Other institutions, they are, they are made for development financing. So I think it's important, of course, for the EIB to figure out how to take more risk, but also how to establish a close, trusted cooperation with other financing institutions so that we know what each other uh, uh, is doing, so that we can complement each other instead of copying each other. 
because a copy of the same thing doesn't serve these many, many differentiated needs uh, that we have, not only in Europe, but indeed uh, all over the planet. Great, thank you. Um, let's move on to talk a little bit about gender. So the latest EIB group strategy on gender actually goes back to 2017. Um, now, the bank is also leading the She Invest initiative, and that's to mobilize around 2 billion euros uh, of gender responsive investments uh, in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. But do you think the EIB should pay a bit more attention to gender, both in terms of its external investments, but also its internal policies and administration? What, what more do you think the bank could do? Well, I have had the privilege of experiencing uh, what it means when you go from gender unbalance to gender balance, um, both in, in the College of Commissioners, uh, where we are uh, an equal number of men and, and women, and also in, in the hierarchy of the services. Uh, I think by the end of this commission mandate, it will be 50-50. Uh, I have seen what it takes to get there, but I have also seen uh, what you get when you get there, when you have uh, a more diversified uh, decision-making body, when, when more different people work on uh, whatever analysis, whatever legislative proposal, uh, whatever enforcement uh, act. So for me, it's not a belief uh, that uh, gender balance is, is needed. It is what I have experienced as something that makes you better. So, so for me, it's, it's really important uh, that the bank, as the bank itself, strive for uh, gender equality and also that the bank, in, in what it does, is aware where there may be stereotypes uh, that need to be broken down. Because it's, it's not only outside of Europe where there is a gender imbalance in, in, in funding, it's also in Europe that there is a gender imbalance. Um, uh, I, I, I would think that there is a possibility to push uh, more. The bank works, for instance, with startup financing with partners in, in member states. And, uh, and when it comes to startups, um, it is, uh, I think the, the data will show you that it is much more difficult for female funders, founders to get financing than for male founders. So I think there's, there's a lot to do outside of Europe and, and in Europe uh, so that we can benefit from all the talent of, uh, of the entire uh, population uh, as staffers, as management, but obviously also as, uh, as people, as entrepreneurs. Thank you, Margreta. I, I just wanted to come back to something you said earlier. Um, uh, at the beginning of this conversation, um, you talked about um, the importance of negotiation and, you know, you spent your whole career sort of negotiating and bringing people to the table and trying to find that consensus. Now, each member state, as, as shareholders of the bank, um, will obviously have their own priorities uh, for the EIB. Um, but are there any particular member states that you think align with your vision? Uh, and who um, we may be able to bring on board to help form that consensus. Well, well, the point of, of consensus is that it starts with disagreement. Um, and the, the interesting thing in, in, in shaping consensus and in shaping compromise is that you disagree in the outset. And in disagreement, things are open. Uh, if you agree on everything, well, why ask another question? Why listen careful? Um, because there's nothing to discuss. So I think it, it's, it's really important uh, that member states bring their different perspectives uh, to the table. But something has been agreed. You know, in our, our European democracy, between the parliament, between uh, the council, you know, strategies have been have been shaped. Uh, the Green Deal for Europe. Uh, that is an overall strategy for Europe to be a carbon neutral uh, continent by 2050. Um, 
our digital decade, that we want technology to serve people, uh, and we that we want uh, cohesion and uh, and um, and balanced uh, social conditions to be the fundamentals uh, in Europe. So I think there is something that we should take as a given, which are the strategies that are set in our democracy. And within that framework, figure out how to get there, uh, how to get there faster, how to get there with taking more risks uh, and how to get more volume. And, uh, and of course, finding uh, the necessary uh, instruments in order for the bank uh, to work with all different kinds of investors, because the bank is not one investor. The bank is an enabling uh, investor in, in many, many different sectors and in many different areas. And, and this, is, this is why it's important that people come also with disagreement, because then things open and you can shape a new consensus and then work from there. Excellent. And to end this fascinating conversation, can I ask you, Margreta, is there anything else that you'd like to share about your candidacy, about the direction you think uh, the bank must take uh, in the coming term? Anything else that you would like to share? Well, I, I have really enjoyed this. It is uh, it's quite rare to have this kind of time uh, to discuss uh, what I have been, been thinking about over the, the last uh, weeks and, and, and months. Uh, and I think we have, we have discussed uh, quite a lot. Uh, one of the things really important for me is that it, it is really seen and felt as a European bank for small member state, mid-sized member state, big member states, for member states who are uh, quite well off, uh, but also, of course, for member states where there is a need because uh, cohesion uh, is not a fact of European life uh, yet. And, and I, I think I feel very strongly about it because it has been my, my everyday life for the ni last nine years. Uh, equal treatment, uh, level playing field, uh, making sure that, that everyone feel that they are equally welcome, uh, no matter uh, where they come from. And if if uh, one country can have one solution, obviously uh, someone else can have the same solution. That kind of, of equality is, is really important for me. So, um, so I, I give it a fair try. And, you know, of course, I hope to be successful in getting this job. But I also hope that it sends a message that if you think you can do a job and do it well, when raise your hand and say, I can do it, take that risk also personally in your in your working life uh even though there is a risk of uh of not getting what you want uh because uh, i feel i get wiser in the process and uh i if i don't get it my vanity will be hurt uh, obviously but i will recover and of course for now i do everything i can to get the job that's excellent thank you so much Margreta, for for joining me for this conversation and I, I wish you all the best. Well, thank you.